In this video we'll be going through the 2018 Wave Systems paper. Question 1. All elements emit a number of distinct fixed wavelengths of light known as spectral lines that are unique to each element. Hydrogen emits four visible light lines as shown below. Or once I insert the actual image that should be there, uh, there, there we go. Light from a hydrogen source can be passed through a diffraction grating to form an interference pattern. The wavelength of each spectral line can then be determined by measuring the angle to its first order maximum. So basically what happens is you have a light source here, your hydrogen light source, and the light rays are going through this here chamber, they are hitting the diffraction grating and then they're being diffracted into your interference pattern. And so you can use this eyepiece here to observe what light is coming in at distinct angles. And then you can use the diffraction equation, which looks like this, where your wavelength is just the wavelength of the light you're using here. Your angle is whatever angle you're measuring. Your order number is, well, how many orders you've seen. Is this the first rainbow, second rainbow, third rainbow? If you've ever used this piece of equipment, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. If not, then you might hopefully still have an appreciation. And of course, your D here is just the slit separation of your diffraction grating. Moving on to our first question. The lines on a diffraction grating are spaced 1.68 times 10 to the minus 6 meters apart. Show that the wavelength for the spectral line with a first order maximum at 16.8 degrees is 486 nanometers. So let's write down what we have. This value here is our D. We're at our first order maximum, so that tells us that our N is equal to 1. Our angle is 16.8. And that's all we need. Our aforementioned equation is this one here. Solving for lambda. And now just putting in our numbers. Which gives me 4.86 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, which in other words is 486 nanometers, which is exactly what we're trying to show. The telescope is rotated from the 16.8 degree position to position Z, the location of the next spectral line. State the wavelength of this line and explain your reasoning. And so the image that we should have been given above, but was just a gray box, I'm going to place it right here. Now, since at our 16.8 degree position, we're looking at the green 486 nanometer line. If we are then increasing our angle, we are going to see a longer wavelength, and that's because it's longer wavelengths that diffract more. And so if we look above at our diagram, you can see that we're moving this to a greater angle, and at a greater angle, we are going to see a greater wavelength. Remember, longer wavelengths diffract more. Therefore, if we look at our picture, let me reinsert it we must be looking at our 656 nanometer red line. So let me explain that. Position Z is at a greater angle. Since longer wavelengths diffract at greater angles, the spectral line can only be the 656 nanometer line. Calculate the maximum number of orders visible for the 656 nanometer line. So let me once again jot down what we know. Okay, and now the crux of this question, I'm going to do a bit of a diagram here that I'm going to rub out. So if we imagine our diffraction grating here, we have our screen and we have our order lines. The trick to doing this question is to set our angle, our order number angle, to 90 degrees. And then at 90 degrees, we're going to get a certain value for our order number n. And so say, for example, if our n is equal to 7.2, just for a random example, 
that would mean that our seven order number line is going to be just before that 90 degrees and our eight order number line is going to be beyond the 90 degrees or in other words the eight won't exist and so if we get an n equals 7.2 for a 90 degree angle that means that there must be a maximum of seven lines so we truncate the decimal so let's do that Remembering our familiar equation, rearranging for n, and now putting our numbers in. And this gives me 2.56. Now, as mentioned before, we need to truncate this number, that is to say, to round it down to the whole number. And so our maximum amount of order numbers visible is going to be Two. The diffraction grating is replaced with a double slit that has a slit separation of 1.68 times 10 to the minus 6 meters, or in other words it has the same slit separation as our diffraction grating. Describe and explain any changes that will occur to the location, brightness and width of the maxima for the 656 nanometer line. And so to kick this off I'm going to draw the diffraction grating pattern and a double slit pattern and we'll talk about their contrasting differences. And so first of all one of the things that I've wanted to draw here is that the separation between our maxima is going to be the same still. Or in other words that the angles for the maxima is going to be the same. Now the next thing is the kind of obvious difference and that is that for the slit the maximas are much more spread out. And so the key difference here is that here we have many sources but for the slit we only have two sources. Now what it means when you have more sources, well that means that you're going to have more areas of interference occurring and the result is these narrower maxima lines. So let's write that. Grating maxima are much more narrow due to there being a much higher amount of sources interfering. Now the last thing to talk about when you get this kind of question and just to be clear this is a typical question that does pop its head up from time to time and it's almost always requiring the same response is that the amount of light coming out of the slit is going to be less and when you think about it it makes a lot of sense so if we think of our slit well we just have two gaps really and that's going to let some amount of light through. Now obviously if we increase the amount of gaps, we've now increased the amount of light coming through and therefore the maxima are going to be brighter. So let's write that down. Since a diffraction grating obstructs less light, its maxima will be brighter. Question two. The speed of sound in air is 344 meters per second. A bull roarer is a carved piece of wood attached to a string. It can be swung around the head to create sounds that travel long distances and fluctuate in pitch. The user can control the changes in pitch by swinging the bull roarer around in a circle at different speeds. The bull roarer emits a note of 2 times 10 to the 2 hertz, which is just 200 hertz. As Joseph swings it in a circle with a period of 1 second and speed 6.28 meters per second, Joseph is at the center of the circle. And we have a nice diagram down here. We have a distant observer and the bull roarer swinging around Joseph. Describe changes in sound that will be heard by a distant observer as the bull roarer moves around the circle. So let's think about what's actually going on here. So you're the distant observer and the bull roarer is moving around in our circle. It's going to be transitioning from moving away to moving towards and in between it's not going to be moving towards you at all. So the overarching concept in this whole question is of course the Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect 
means that when the bull roarer is moving towards our distant observer, the frequency is going to be increased. When it's moving away, the frequency is going to be decreased. At these specific points in the middle, we have a halfway in between where the velocity of the bull roarer is going to be zero in the direction of the observer. And so at these two points, we are going to have our true frequency, the frequency that we'd hear otherwise if the bull roarer wasn't moving at all. So having established all of this, let's actually answer the question. We're asked to describe the changes in sound heard by the distant observer but we're not really asked to explain it. So the changes that are going to be heard is simply that the frequency is going to increase and decrease. The observed frequency will alternately increase and decrease. When the bull roarer is at the position shown in figure A on page four, calculate the wavelength of the sound waves that Joseph will hear. And so this question is something of a trick question because we're talking about Joseph and if you're dung-ho what you'll do is you'll launch into the Doppler effect equation and figure things out using the values that we have above here but that only applies if the bull roarer has a velocity in the direction of the observer and in the case of our distant observer well that's true that's true when the bull roarer has a velocity towards it's true when the bull roarer has a velocity away. It's not true at these two points, but it is in between them. For Joseph, however, he's swinging the bull roarer around him at a constant, we assume, radius. What that means is that the bull roarer is never getting closer or further away, and so the bull roarer is essentially stationary relative to him. Though, of course, it is still moving around him. But the point is, there will be no Doppler effect observed by Joseph, and so the frequency that we are calculating is simply the true frequency as if the bull roarer was stationary. We can find that knowing that the frequency is 200 hertz and that the speed of sound and air is 344 meters per second. The equation that we're going to use can be found on your formula sheet, and it looks like this. Rearranging for wavelength, putting our numbers in, gives me 1.72 meters to three significant figures. Explain why the sound waves observed by the distant observer will not have the same wavelength that Joseph experiences. And so this question is basically asking us to show that we know what the Doppler effect is and how it works. So let me throw down an explanation. The Doppler effect causes the wavelength of sound from a moving source to be smaller ahead and larger behind. As the bull roarer moves towards and away from the observer, they observe this as a change in pitch. Joseph does not, as the bull roarer neither moves towards or away from him. Clearly mark on the diagram in figure A the two positions of the bull roarer at which the distant observer will measure the same frequency as Joseph. Explain why the frequency at these points is the same as what Joseph would measure. And so we've already discussed this. The points at which the distant observer here will hear the same as Joseph are these two points here. And that's because at these two points the bull roarer's velocity is this way and this way, and it is not at all in the direction of the distant observer, meaning that at these points, very momentarily, the bull roarer is neither moving towards or away from the distant observer. So let's write that down. At these two points, the bull roarer is briefly neither moving towards or away from the distant observer. Calculate the maximum and minimum frequencies that a distant observer will measure during one revolution of the bull roarer. Use these to draw a graph of the variation of frequency against time, starting from the position shown in figure A on page 4. So let's quickly jot down what we know. And so the equation for the Doppler effect looks like this. Putting in our numbers, gives me 196 
hurt to three significant figures, and 204 hurts to three significant figures. Now the reason I have two values here is because we have our plus minus sign, so I've done this equation both for a plus sign there and for a minus sign. And so this frequency here is our away frequency, it's lower, whereas this one is our towards. So we're asked to draw this starting from figure A on page 4, so let's just look where the hell that was. And so at our figure A point, our bull roarer here is moving away. Which means we're going to start at our away frequency here of 196, which is here. And since our period is one second and our graph runs for one second, our wave is going to return there in exactly one second. So we also have our point here. Halfway in between, we're going to reach our maximum, which is our 204. And at each quarter, we're going to cross our 200 hertz. So let me try and draw this nicely. There we go. Question 3. Clara wants to investigate the properties of a 0.4 meter length of solid steel rod. The bar is clamped rigidly at the center, and the ends are free to vibrate. The rod is struck in such a way as to produce a fundamental longitudinal standing wave. Show that the wavelength of the wave is 0.8 meters. A diagram should be included in your answer. So let's look at what's actually going on here. So at the point where the steel rod is clamped, we are going to have a node. At the ends, since they're free to vibrate, we're going to have antinodes. Our first harmonic is therefore going to look something like this. So let's look at the relationship between the length of the steel rod and the length of the wave. Now as we can see, we have a trough here and we have a peak here, which means that if we look at a wave, our whole wavelength is going to be a peak to a peak, which means that half a wavelength is a trough to a peak. That's our half wavelength. And of course what we're looking at here is exactly what we have right here, where this half wavelength is equal to the length of our steel rod. So let's write that. Rearranging for lambda putting in our length, and that of course gives us our 0.8 meters, which is exactly what we're trying to find. One end of the rod is attached to a diaphragm that can move freely inside a clear plastic tube. The clear plastic tube is closed at the opposite end. On the bottom of the clear plastic tube is a fine white powder. When the steel rod is struck, the white powder forms into ridges that are half a wavelength apart. The steel rod still vibrates at the fundamental frequency. The frequency of the vibrations in the air in the tube is the same as the frequency of the vibrations in the steel rod. Explain why this is true for the frequency, but not for the wavelength of the two vibrations. OK, so let's look at our diagram. So this comes down to the fact that the rate that waves are excited at in the steel rod is the same as the rate that they're excited at in the air in the tube. For this reason, the frequency is of course going to be the same. The wavelength, however, is going to be different because the speed of the waves in each of these cases is different. Specifically, the wavelength in the steel rod is going to be larger because the wave speed is larger. Meaning that by the time another peak is excited in the steel rod, the previous peak has moved a greater distance because it's traveling faster. So let's write that down. The rate that waves are excited is the same in both materials, so the frequencies are the same. The wave speed in the steel rod is larger, resulting in compressions traveling a greater distance before the next compression is generated. Thus the wavelength in the steel rod is greater. Clara measures the ridges to be 2.3 times 10 to the minus 2 meters apart. Calculate the speed of sound in the rod. So to make this here value a little bit more easier to write, we could just write that as 0.023 meters. 
and let's start off by writing down what we know. We know the velocity of the wave in air. We know that our ridges are half a wavelength apart, which means that our 0.023 meters is equal to our half wavelength. We know that the wavelength in the steel rod is 0.8 meters. And so we'll call this our lambda a, our wavelength in air. And with that, we have everything we need. Though let's just quickly solve this for our lambda a. We just need to double our 0.23, which gives us 0.046 meters. So on your formula sheet, you'll find the equation that the velocity is equal to frequency times lambda. Solving that for frequency gives us velocity over lambda. Now, one thing that we know is that the frequency in our steel rod is equal to the frequency in our air. We just spent a whole question explaining why that's the case, which means we can substitute our V over lambda for our frequency. And now multiply both sides by lambda S to solve for Vs. And now just put in our numbers. And that gives me 5,980 meters per second to three significant figures. The clamp stand is adjusted and the steel rod is struck in such a way as to produce a standing wave of the second harmonic in the rod. Explain the effect this will have on the air inside the tube. Okay, so there's a sort of a chain of events here that we need to go through, so we'll just launch into them in order. The second harmonic has double the frequency. A closed pipe can only produce odd numbered harmonics. Since the pipe must have been excited at an odd harmonic, doubling the frequency would excite an even harmonic. As the closed pipe cannot do this, no harmonics occur. And we're done.